Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, I'm Scott Hambrick, and we have Carl with us, Carl Shute, again yeah. today, and on Carl's recommendation, we read book three, book the third, is yes. what it says, book the third of the Joyful Wisdom by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. This is, the, this is the one that has the whole God is dead rant in it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, well, I just remember seeing on a bathroom wall once, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, God is dead, signed Nietzsche, and then Nietzsche is dead signed god you know it's something that you you hear that some philosopher said this at one time and what the heck does he mean by it and uh you know if you're um a more religious type you might be real offended by it but i think it's a value even if you are i think you need to understand what he's saying maybe especially if you are yeah so well we could start so uh the books the joyful wisdom or the gay science depending on the translation you get uh, it's great fun. It's a bunch of mostly random aphorisms and short paragraphs. Um, Nietzsche had difficulty with his vision. He had a hard time writing. Uh, oh, is that why, you think? Yeah, and he had blinding headaches. He was not a healthy gentleman. Um, and so he, as he goes on in his career, his writing gets shorter and shorter. Do you think he was an incel? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I was reading a biography. and, and He would so- definitely have been on 4chan. Oh, for sure. But like, there's something she quotes him talking about how having the big mustache allows you to be at a party and not have to talk to anybody. Mm. So facial hair is a self-defense mechanism. And if you look him up on Google Images, he has an excellent mustache. It's uh, it, I I dream of having a mustache like that. So we could start. I think in paragraph 108, the paragraphs are numbered. Uh, there's this image that he has that was bugging me so he says after buddha was dead people showed his shadow for centuries afterwards in a cave an immensely frightful shadow so you have to imagine you go wherever it was that buddha was that he's dead but at one time his shadow was on the wall and the the enterprising monks are probably taking admission and having people come in and look at his shadow and uh nietzsche uses this as an image god is dead but as the human race is constituted there will perhaps be caves for millenniums yet in which people will show his shadow. And we, we have still to overcome his shadow. So Nietzsche is an atheist in his own belief, but he thinks God has a shadow. And um, that's a... a Did you find in caves. Right. Well, in a cave. Well, where's the cave? What does the cave mean? No, this is the Online Great Books podcast. We read Plato, and everybody remembers from Plato the cave, Right. The cave from book uh, book Let's seven see. of the Republic, six or seven. I don't know. I can't. One remember. of them. Uh, and uh, there you are in the cave, and you you don't get to see the way things really are. You're just looking at flickering shadows on the wall. Well, one of these flickering shadows is is God's shadow, and for me, that's a that's a big deal. So we live in a pretty secular age, where not a lot of people have use for God, and and. You know, in this podcast, I, you know, that's fine, whatever. But you should know that if there is no God, that a lot more goes away than just whatever religion is that bothers you. Um, that there's a whole lot of things that are based on the thought that there's one cause for the universe. And if you get rid of that, there's a whole lot of other things you have to get rid of. There's a whole lot of shadows. Yeah, the, the shadows. So, like, if you think uh, the universe, if you have, there's some ideas that we talk about casually that don't really make much sense. Like, if you think the universe is leading towards some ultimate goal, if you think that there's such a thing as progress. That's book 109, or I'm sorry, paragraph 109 in here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and read it, or a chunk of it. It says, let us be on our guard against thinking that the world is a living being. And then I'll skip down here a couple lines. He says, let us now be on our guard against believing that the universe is a machine. It is assuredly not constructed with a view to one end. Um, And so he, in that paragraph there, 
he pretty much says that it is not a deterministic system. It doesn't lead anywhere. He doesn't say chaos. If I don't, if I remember correctly, he doesn't say it's chaotic. But uh, well, actually, he he does. So I want to just I want to disagree slightly. It could be deterministic, but it's to no purpose. To no purpose. It's a, a Rube Goldberg Rube Goldberg machine that does not crack the egg at the end. It's just made. Just it's it's not even made. It's just a series of things that happen. Um, I remember a poster I saw where you were supposed to gaze at the structure of the universe and the stars. And um, it was an atheist friend of mine that sent it to me. And I, I'm supposed to feel a mystic sense of wonder at the universe. And I'm thinking, yeah. no, no. It, if you're right, this is just, this is just a blind, empty thing. There's, it's like, it's like Ahab in Moby Dick. The biggest problem he has with that whale is the whale doesn't care about him. That's another show. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great book. You need to read that one someday. Um, here's another. Uh, so how could you presume to blame or praise the universe? That's a quote from Nietzsche in this same paragraph. There isn't anything to blame. The universe doesn't have a mind. It doesn't have any purpose. Sometimes people casually think, like, the universe wanted me to meet you today. Yeah, he no. says there's not even chance. Right. Right. It, it, yeah. So there's one big shadow. So how's he not a nihilist? How is he not a nihilist? Because he doesn't despair at this. That's a real good question. How is he not a nihilist? Um, If there is no meaning to be gotten from God or the structure of the universe or progress or whatever, where, where is there left to get meaning? You could say there is none, so to hell with it. Or you could say there is none, I'm going to make some. And that option two is what Nietzsche is doing. That's his will to power. Yeah, which... You have this will to create, will to do, and that's enough. Hmm? Well, that's all you got. <laughs> that's all you got, <laughs> so it might as well be enough. What else are you going to do, right? right? So uh, it's more of an aesthetic view, make of your life a beautiful thing, rather than thinking that you're accomplishing some purpose, because uh, there, there ain't none. Um, here's another shadow of God. Laws of nature. Like, so uh, he says, let us be on our guard against saying that there are laws in nature. This is a little further in the same paragraph. There are only necessities. There is no one who commands, no one who obeys, no one who transgresses. There is no design if he's right. So the fact that the rock falls, this is not a law. There's nobody that says it's going to fall it's just we've observed it falling a million times in the past. You actually have no guarantee that it's going to fall in the future. So if you have any sort of, like these, uh, the basic axioms of the sciences, that the universe is an orderly whole that you can predict and map out with math, that's a shadow of God. That 9.81 meters per second squared, that that's true today. Is it going to be true tomorrow? Can't prove it. Can't prove it. So if, um, so both of us have kids, and if your kids depend upon you to be a certain way, so they can trust that tomorrow you're going to be somewhat the same kind of person that you are today. So they can have um, a reasonable expectation that their life's not going to change 180 degrees tomorrow because you're around. If you're not around, you were the one enforcing the law. If you're not around, you know, why would you expect that that these laws of nature would stay the same in the future? So they have so far, but uh, do you have a well-grounded reason to believe that they will? This thing's not just aphorisms. I mean, he, he walks... Th- this first half of this book is... It builds point upon point somewhat. Because mm-hmm. just to your point, like, why would you think that these laws of nature would persist, like you just said... Paragraph 110 is about the origin of knowledge. And he says that knowledge has been a collection, I'll paraphrase this, tell me if I'm right, a collection of ideas that have been helpful to the human race. The end. <laughs> well, that, that, that's, uh, that's, how he val- that's how he verifies the truth claim here. Has it been helpful to humans or not? 
He yeah. Says, uh, he says, throughout immense stretches of time, the intellect produced nothing but errors. Some of them proved to be useful and preservative of the species. He who fell in with them or inherited them waged the battle for himself and his offspring with better success. Those yeah. erroneous articles of faith were transmitted by inheritance and finally become the property and stock of the human species. And then he lists what these errors of yeah, knowledge so are. I, I want to give the list. So there's some so things. Good. So that there are enduring things. Okay. So uh, for, I'm, I'm looking at, at Scott right now and I'm treating him as if he is an enduring thing. And yet while I'm looking at him, his, some of his cells are dying and some of them are, are growing and his hair is growing and, you know, um, bits, of him are, yeah, bits of him are flaking off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this chair is covered with Scott Dander. So in what sense is he the same person as he was when we started this 10 or 15 minutes ago? So to call him a thing is to presume that there's some sort of eternal category into which he he fits. And But you never perceive the eternal category. It's like when you do geometry, you never actually perceive a triangle. We, we got to zip through this list because it's crazy. Uh, that there are equal things. That there, well, that there are enduring things, that there are equal things, that there are things. Yeah. What? Substances and bodies. That a thing is what it appears, that our will is free, and that what is good for me is also good absolutely. Right. And he calls these the errors of the species. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he calls them errors. So whether they're errors or not depends on whether he's right on the big question, which is, is there a God or not? Is And, you know, keep it abstracted a bit we could just have it be an aristotelian prime mover is there some sort of cause that gives some order to the whole thing if there isn't then you know i kind of think he's right well if, if he if he was right then he's right about this i mean yeah. he's right in, in one 109 yeah but this is this is rejecting aristotle you know he he rejects the things substances bodies so material cause essential cause and formal cause. He Is that right? I think that's right. That's the, those are the parallels there that he mm-hmm. rejects. So this is not just a, kind of an epistemology, like a, you know, how do we know things thing here, but it's also a, a metaphysical proclamation right. about so, what can be known here too. This yeah. is pretty heavy and he just kind of tosses it out there as a matter of fact and with nothing. It's so much fun. Else. Yeah. It's so much fun. Like logic, logic itself. So this, I used to... That's a thing. I mean, you can... Is it a thing or isn't it a thing? Isn't it funny, though, that people now say, oh, that's a thing? <laughs> like they, they make these like metaphysical claims about uh, memes on 4chan or whatever. Oh, it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> so, hey, okay, so this is, I'm going to do a parenthesis. Am I allowed to do that? Parens, yes. Yeah, so um, the word thing. So this is what I got from Heidegger a while back. The word, the word thing actually means, well... In Iceland, the parliament in Iceland, which is the oldest functioning democracy in the world, it's been a thousand years or so, the parliament in Iceland is called the thing. It's the all thing. A thing is, it's hard to say what a thing means without using the word thing. A thing is an entity about which you should be concerned. But I've begged the question because I've already called it an entity. So you you, you, you use that properly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I was a professor of logic. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I did teach logic. But uh, so there's a fire in the barn and it's burned down and you need to get all the neighbors together to see what you're going to do. Are we going to help him? How are we going to do it? So that's a thing, right? It's a matter for concern. So we extend that to the stuff that you perceive around you. Uh, is it a thing? Is it um, like... Uh, uh, what would be a good example of that? How do the kids use it today? Oh, uh, well, it's it's normally about memes or ways of being. Oh, is that a thing now? Yeah. Like dating? Was that a thing? Is that a thing? It used to be a thing. Yeah. It used to be a matter of concern, right? We used to worry about it. I uh, still am. <laughs> like, what are these kids going to do? <laughs> so that's the meaning of it. And if if Nietzsche's right, then are there things? He says there are not things. So, you know, we're reading this in translation, and what's the word he uses? It's probably like, thing in German, actually. Ding. Yeah, yeah probably. Um, it was only very late 
that the deniers and doubters of such propositions came forward. You know, <laughs> so his contemporaries, I guess these German idealists and stuff, are start bringing. Well, and that, British that, empiricists. Yeah, yeah. That, empiricists is that be like Bentham and is that is that yeah and John Stuart Mill and, yeah. and uh, John Locke and David Hume. Where I mean, you can see something similar in David Hume, like uh, paragraph one twelve, the bit about cause and effect. Um, you see, you, you flick the light switch and the light comes on, and you think that you've perceived cause and effect. Well, cause and effect, whatever it is, it's not a perceptual thing. It's a it's a something else. So, is wait it, a minute, is it objective? I well, that's the big question. You know. If you think it's objective, if you think that there are causes and effects that you can predict and make make determinations from, that is a shadow of God, because the enforcer of cause and effect would be the order inherent in the universe. And if we're not sure that there's order inherent in the universe, we're a bit at sea on cause and effect. Yeah, and Nietzsche is, he's not even sure about it. He doesn't believe it, or at yeah. least he didn't when he wrote this. Yeah, I love the line that he has in paragraph 112. We describe better, we explain just as little as our predecessors. So I used to play a game in in, uh, in class uh, about gravity. So I, I would hold out a pen. I'm sure my students would get sick of that. And I'd, I'd say, what's going to happen when I let go? And they'd say that it's going to fall. And I'd say, how do you know? And then there'd be silence. Well, how do you know? Because it always has in the past. Okay, you have mystical powers of prediction. Can you give me lottery numbers? The problem of induction. Yeah, the problem of induction. It sounds like magic. You know, I'm going to predict what's going to happen in the future. So I would come up with a story. So I have Gravo the gravity elf. And Gravo lives down at the center of the earth. And, and what he does is he reaches up. Gravo? <laughs> Gravo. Yeah, Gravo the All gravity right, somebody elf. Somebody needs to meme that up. <laughs> he looks like Carl. <laughs> and he reaches up and he grabs the pen and he pulls it down because he, he wants everything to be down. I don't know why. He just does. And he's one of the great gods of my cosmos, is Grava the Gravity Elf. And you may say, well, that's a stupid story. We all know what it is. It's gravity. Well, what's gravity? Gravity is just the Latin word meaning heaviness. And heaviness is the property that makes things go towards the center of the earth. And so have you explained anything more than I have? Probably not. Probably not. Or you can come up with gravitons or space-time continuum or whatever, but um, these are abstractions that you've never actually perceived. So uh, we're a bit at sea. So he says a little bit later, this is page 158 in the version that we did, which you could find on archive.org. We operate only with things which do not exist, with lines surfaces, bodies, atoms, divisible times, divisible spaces. How can explanation ever be possible when we first make everything a conception, our conception? So human thought works in the realm of concepts, and concepts are constructed. But the great mistake you can make is you can think that they're real, that your conception is real. That's, that's all of Socrates' problems. What is justice? Right. Right, and so you, virtue. so you got two, well, here's the two directions, right? So you can go with Socrates, which, you know, personally, I'm inclined to go with Socrates, but, you know, Friedrich's my friend. <laughs> you know, I love both of them. But so Socrates says, yeah, we're going to presume that there are forms, that there are eternal realities that you can get to, that concepts somehow partake of them. That's a good story. I hope it's true. Nietzsche says, well, that's, that's a shadow of God, and you've gotten rid of God, and you think you can keep all of this stuff. And you probably shouldn't, just for consistency, right? If there's no realm of forms, then there's no forms. And if there's no forms, well, that changes everything. Which I guess could be a summary of why I think, I was, why I think Nietzsche is important. Why I think this pass, the passages we're looking at today is particularly important, is that... We have a secular world where everyone, nobody cares about God, fine. But they think it doesn't matter that they don't. It's like just a shrug. You know, all of that stuff is, is old hat and, and it doesn't matter at all. But it changes everything. It changes everything. Should we look at paragraph 125? 
Well, the big paragraph, and you want to do something I, else. I have first. a question here. Yeah. So he, right, he, so he talks here about causes. Well, right after this little line about conception you read, he talks about causes, and then he says, the peculiarity, for example, in every chemical process seems a miracle. Same as before, just like all locomotion, nobody has explained impulse. So, you know, it's, it's prime mover stuff. Like, things are moving. Things happen. Things happen. Mm-hmm. by this impulse. He says, how could we ever explain it? What is the impulse? What is he talking about? It was not clear to me what impulse was for him here. Uh, which page is this? It's 158, right underneath that chunk you read about conception. We operate only with things which do not exist, with lines, right. surfaces, bodies, atoms, divisible times. How can an explanation ever be possible we make everything a conception. But he talks about this impulse, this miracle. I don't know what that means. Yeah, so that actually, it's a little bit above. Well, I'm not sure exactly what he means there. Uh, impulse was like a, when the baseball bat hits the ball and you apply, S- you sudden, change the momentum of the ball, that's impulse. Sudden acceleration or deceleration. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's all weird. The thing, you know, perhaps this could be the value of Nietzsche is that it makes you realize just how strange everything is, how uncanny everything is. You can get settled into modes of thought, ways of conception, little tools that we use um, that you think are just the way the world is and you don't realize that they're axioms. Everything's a heuristic. Yeah. Everything's a way of thinking about it and they aren't the thing. The way you think about it isn't yeah. das Ding. The way you think about it is not the thing. That bears repeating. The concept is not the thing. The concept is something you've constructed to deal with the world of appearances. And if it gets close to the thing, yeah. great, but I don't know how that happens. Yeah, he, 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 I think in this paragraph here, this 112, that, that he says, I try to, I try to summarize all these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That he's saying that we describe, but we do not explain. Right. I think that's fair. Yeah. And I actually agree with that. I don't agree with all much that he says, but I, I do. I do think I do agree with that piece. Well, so if you start, if you do geometry, you know at the beginning that you're starting with unprovable axioms, right? Yeah, you're talking about. You just a while ago you said he shows just how strange everything is. Uh huh. Euclid shows that everything's really strange. Yeah. Yeah. And you get too far down the line, like say you just learn in, in high school that uh, the area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. I hope that's correct. I hope I remember that right. And, and you don't know how you get all of that. And you think, oh, lines. Lines are just these things I draw on a page. And <laughs> No, a line is breathless extension. Is that what it is? A widthless length. <laughs> breathless length. Uh, we start our sciences with assumed things, with axioms which have no actual existence. Um, They're the shadows. You you done messed up, he says. Right, right. If you go into the realm of morality, of how humans live, there are some. Uh, there's a whole bunch of errors uh, and poisons and things that humans do. <sighs> so, like um, one fifteen, paragraph one fifteen. Uh, So we're going to go from the sciences into human activity. Man has been reared by his errors. Firstly, he saw himself always imperfect. Secondly, he attributed to himself imaginary qualities. Thirdly, he felt himself a false position, felt himself in a false position in relation to animals and nature. Fourthly, he always devised new tables of values and accepted them for a time as eternal and unconditioned. So I want to go back to these real quick. Um, You saw yourself as imperfect, like, Nobody's perfect. We say that about humans. Let's pause for a minute and see how weird that is. So, uh, sitting here with with friends and and having a good time, and that might be something we say. Nobody's perfect, but because we all make mistakes, that's what we say. The lions on the savanna. Do they ever stop and say, "Lions aren't perfect"? They're perfect lions. They are perfect lions. They're doing what lions do. There's no moral failure that a lion can have. You know, um, when Peter Singer writes in his book on animal rights about how you shouldn't eat animals. (laughs) Peter Singer. (laughs) But then 
he actually deals with this question. He says something, you know, well, what about the lion? We're going to teach the lion to be a vegetarian. No, you're not. Uh, the, the, but then he said, he makes the same error. He says, humans are the sorts of things that can actually change their behavior, that we're imperfect and we could be more perfect. We mm -hmm. could all be vegetarians. According it's the to progressive him. project. Right. Well, right. It is a progressive project to improve on human nature. Well, that's a shadow of God. That's messianism. You might as well just go to church. You know, uh, that you're going to make humans better? You might as well. Hey, look, Scott, if there's no if there's if there's no God, there's no better. That's the big point. Axiology goes away. There is no better. Yeah, there's, you don't have a ruler. How would you know if it was better? Right. Right. So the way humans act is just the way humans act. And humans kill each other and humans exploit each other. But it, you wouldn't even be able to use a word like exploit about it. Yeah, he, he, he rejects using the ruler. So the progressive wouldn't. They might. So they might. I might be able to say, okay, there's no God, but here are the measures by which we would say that things were, quote unquote, better. Yeah. So what's going on there? Let's go to to error number four. He always devised new tables of values and accepted them for a time as eternal and unconditioned. So if there is no ruler, where do the values come from? He says they're happy accidents of, and errors of thinking. Or they're constructed. Okay, so there's some other books you could read. Um, Genealogy of Morals is fun on this. Uh, Beyond Good and Evil. Elzel Sprach Zarathustra. Um, if, so you asked a question earlier. Why isn't he a nihilist? You say nihilist, I say nihilist. Um, so you construct values. And who is it that constructs values? And, and why would they construct them? Well, what I think is it ends up being an exercise of the will. So the reason that a certain worldview is the thing we ought to go for is because the people in power say it's the thing we ought to go for. That's Shudian. That's you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let's say Nietzsche's right. Okay. And Nietzsche says morality is the end of, in, in morality. Morality. The individual is taught to become a function of the herd. Right. So I guess you got two questions there. On the, the lower level and then the, the bigger level. The lower level, you as an individual, the reason why you feel shame and guilt and all of that, the things you feel shame and guilt about are the things that harm what he calls the herd of human beings. Okay. But if we know that the whole thing is unfounded, where did the values come from? The values came from uh, Solon of Athens, you know, or, or somebody, or Jesus, or somebody that, that makes up a table of values. The valuations and orders of rank are always the expression of the needs of the community or herd. That's what he says. That's where they come from. They're emergent yeah. from the needs of the herd. Yeah, well, who runs the herd? The herd. They're like the lions. It's a perfect <laughs> herd. <laughs> well, but there's usually a chief. It's herds all the way down. <laughs> okay, so you have like a, don't you have like a an alpha? And it's the top of the herd. Right. Right. And the alpha says, this is what we're going to go after. And everyone else says, yeah, yeah. But Nietzsche doesn't posit an alpha. Not in this book, oh, he doesn't. Right. Okay. In other books, he does. Yeah. You're smuggling other texts in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Text smuggler. I'm hoping you're not going to quit reading with this book. <laughs> right. By the way, I should have said this right at the very beginning of this. Um, this isn't a really tough read. We're nerding out on it. Uh, but it's good bathroom reading. You could read one of these paragraphs at a time, mm -hmm. I think, and do just fine. So you guys, you know, maybe you should just stop right now. Go ahead and read it and then listen to it again later. Yeah. And we haven't even gotten to the good paragraph. Mm -mm. Should we go to the good paragraph? Oh, hell, let's do it. It's poetic. So that's paragraph 125. Um, 119 is titled, No Altruism. Kind of like that. <laughs> and then 125, The Madman. Have you ever heard of a madman who on a bright morning lighted a lantern and ran to the marketplace calling out unceasingly, I seek God, I seek God. It's Diogenes. It is. Yeah, so Diogenes is supposedly a little lantern and was walking around in the Agora yelling that he wanted, he was looking for an honest man. Mm-hmm. So Nietzsche puts a little twist on it here. Can I do a parenthesis? Do it. 
Okay, so Frederick Copleston wrote a, a wonderful series of books about philosophers, um, except that you ought to read the actual books, but still, Copleston has a classic set, and he was a Jesuit priest, and he's talking about Diogenes. And Diogenes... Uh, this is PG-13, Diogenes, to show his contempt for the human race. He was a cynic. He would masturbate in the public square. Right. Go to the theater and just, like, and, Pee-wee Herman. Well, but Copleston doesn't want to say that. So right. he says, Diogenes would do that in the public square, which ought to be done in private, or perhaps not at all. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> if we didn't already know the story, you'd have no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> you like, he picked his nose all of what? <laughs> Yeah, it's... Diogenes is my kid's favorite. Yeah, yeah. We we have a big tree in the backyard that probably isn't going to make it. Where they were like, they have the chainsaw sculpture guy come and make a, a Diogenes, Diogenes with, with a ladder, a lantern, and looks know, like the guy on the back of Led Zeppelin four. Yeah, yeah, that could be good. So anyway, we were in paragraph one twenty five. So he's saying, "I seek God. I seek God." As there were many people standing about who did not believe in God, he caused a great deal of amusement. Why? Is he lost? said one. Has he strayed away like a child? said another. Or does he keep himself hidden? Is he afraid of us? Has he taken a sea voyage? Has he emigrated? The people cried out laughingly, all in a hubbub. Um, and this is me again. So this, if you ever read the story of Elijah and the false prophets in the Old Testament, um, Elijah makes fun of the prophets of Baal in the same way. They're calling on their, their God. And he's not answering. He's like, where'd he go? Is he on a journey? Is he off, you know, urinating? You know, it, it's, where'd he go? Um, but they don't seem to think it's a big deal. Big deal. There's no God. So what? Do you want to read some more? Sure. Yeah, the insane man jumped into their midst and transfixed them with his glances. Where is God gone? He called out. I mean to tell you, we have killed him. You and I, we are all his murderers. But how have we done it? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? What did we do when we loosened the earth from its sun? Whither does it now move? Whither do we move? Away from all suns? Do we not dash on unceasingly backwards, sideways, forwards in all directions? Is there still an above and below? Do we not strain as as through infinite nothingness? Does not empty space breathe upon us? Has it not become colder? Et cetera, et cetera. One more line. Maybe two. Is not the magnitude of this deed too great for us? Shall we not ourselves have to become gods merely to seem worthy of it? And it's poetic and uh, it's um, haunting that the entire structure of thought that we have, that we take for granted, comes from a metaphysics that is structured and ordered top to bottom. And if you take out the top, the bottom falls apart. Yep. And there are all kinds of stand-ins for the top, you know, for all you pointy-headed people out there. Uh, you've got the Aristotelian prime mover. You've got your big bang. you got whatever. But there has to be a top. You have to have, or a root, you have to have mm-hmm. axioms you stand on. And, um well, I'm, I want to read a little bit more here. Um, shall we not have to light lanterns in the morning? Do we not hear the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell the divine putrefaction? For even God's putrefy. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. But how do we kill him? He doesn't say. Uh, well, how do you kill him? Uh, I like that image of God putrefying, you know? Cause, cause for even they... Yeah. Well, how do you kill him? You... you uh, I think, well, who would these people be? Like, David Hume would be one of them. Yeah, I think all the questions that he asks here, uh, do we not dash on unceasingly, backwards, forward, sideways, all directions? Is there still an above and below? I think he's like, we've, we've, over, we've over-measured, well, over-thought, over, 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 over-analyzed everything until there's no mystery. And now that there's no mystery, there's nothing. Right. Well, okay, so technically as a point of logic... So I'm going off script here because Nietzsche would say, logic, bah. Well, anyway, from a point of logic, you can't disprove. You, well, you couldn't kill God actually, right? If there is actually a God, you can't kill him. Right. Logically, you cannot disprove. It seems to me, this is a point, that maybe you can't prove there is a God, but you can't prove there isn't. 
not if God is actually outside of the universe, nothing in the universe could be used to disprove. Um, so what would the killing of God be? It would, it would be, um, just ceasing to believe, just making it not making there not be a peak to the metaphysics. There's not a goal, an origin to which all things lead. Um, it's like, uh, Oh, here's a good example. So it's like you have an encrypted file and God would be the, the passphrase. Scott's rolling his eyes at me. <laughs> that's, that's super nerdy. Yeah, well, that's who I am. The secret decoder ring. Yeah, and you lost the ring. You lost the passphrase. Like, to get my Bitcoin back, I have this long passphrase that I need to enter in and get it again. Well, if I lose it, now I just got numbers, but they don't mean anything. So you've lost the passphrase and the world really doesn't mean anything. But the point of the prophet coming into the square and nobody paying attention is nobody seems to notice. And so we use words like progress, we use words like good and bad. Um, and uh, we still think science makes sense. And we don't realize that, no, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Absolute morality, that something is absolutely right or not, that's a shadow of God. So, I don't know, slavery in the United States. Um, is it an absolute truth that humans not ought not to be enslaved by other humans? Well, I suppose if there's a God, it might be. But if there isn't, the only reason there's not slavery is because the North won. In other words, it's an exercise of the will, not an exercise of... Of. But, 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 and that's what people do. <laughs> and then, no, really, and then they insert their, whatever they made up. Well. But it, but it, it boils down to an act of the will. Right. But we still talk as if we can appeal to logic. Like, I'm going to try to convince you to come over to my position as if, so this is one of my favorite lines from Thomas Aquinas. He, he has, he had two sumas and in one of them he says, uh, I'm going to appeal to reason to which all men must agree. Very optimistic of Thomas Aquinas. And so if you try to convince somebody of something, you're presuming that there there are forms. You're presuming that there's a shared reality that we can access and that I can get you to see the thing that I see. You don't think that's true? Well, actually, I do think that's true, but... This isn't about me, it's about Nietzsche. So we're taking Nietzsche's starting point. If God is dead, if there's no God, right, then there's no, there's no, there's no logical convincing of people. There's merely, there might be persuasion where you, you trick somebody. It might all be rhetoric, exercises of power, you know, um, I, you might see a bit of this in the, um, in the lack of engagement between different political polls now. Nobody really tries to convince the other side. They try to deplatform them, shut them down. Um, there's no there's no real thought that there's a way to reach consensus. So let's just crush them. N Nietzsche doesn't... He lays these things, these ideas out there. And then that's really all he does he doesn't really tell us many of the consequences of this God is dead thing here. Yeah. Well, this book's still a little bit early. You might want to look, I mean, you have to look at some other stuff. Where do you go from here? And this, but on the other hand, this is where you and I, I think agree that this is where Nietzsche is at his best is in, he's the guard dog. He's seeing what's going on. He's barking. Nobody's listening. Um, when you say, when, when you read the stuff about the more positive constructions, I don't know that that's as good. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to do about it? We're waiting around for the, the Ubermensch, you know, the one who's going to bring us new meaning. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not so much on board with that stuff. But he's a real good diagnost diagnostician. I think that's how you say yeah. that word. Yeah, he's the canary in the mine. And, and, and he says here at the end of his little story about the, who he calls the madman, the madman is, gets frustrated with everybody. And he says, I've, I came, I've come too early. <laughs> I'm not yet at the right time. This prodigious event is still on its way and is traveling, has not yet reached men's ears. Lightning and thunder need time. The light of the stars needs time. Deeds need time, even if they are done, to be seen and heard. 
This deed is as yet further from them than the furthest star, and yet they have done it. Um, and the story goes on. He says, It is further stated that the madman made his way into different churches on the same day, and there intoned some Latin stuff. And <laughs> Requiem eternam dea. I, I, <laughs> yeah, give eternal rest to God. That's what he's chanting. And when led out and called to account, he always gave the reply, What are these churches now if they are not tombs and monuments of God? Yeah. And that's the end of that piece. You know, that's one of the most, that's probably the most, that God is dead and we have killed him. Uh, it's probably the most famous syllables that he wrote. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much all of it. We're not missing, we didn't leave out much context there or anything. That's pretty much all of it. Yeah. So the, I guess, so like I said, that what's the point of this? So let's say you're on his team. You're probably not on his team. The team thing is, you. nobody's, nobody's on his team. Um, he has, he says somewhere later, there's like five, he's talking about Germany. There's five political opinions you're allowed to have. And if you don't have one of those five, everybody hates you. I think he's, he's, he's not one of the five. No. So, um, some alternative teams here, you know, if you are on team religion, I guess, what can you take from this? Uh, well, it ought to matter. It ought to make, it make a difference. If what you say is true, it ought to make a difference. You ought to be able to deal with these attacks, right? You might have to commit to some more full, full bore Platonism. If you can beat Nietzsche, you can beat anybody. Let's put it that way. Well, if you're on the other side, if you're on the side where you think, uh, yeah, there's no God. Well, you ought to realize what it is you're saying. You know, you're not, you shouldn't shrug at the end of this. Yeah. When he says God is dead, it's, that doesn't necessarily mean the image you have uh, from the wacky Sunday school that you went to seven times when you were nine. <laughs> um, Did you go to a snake handler church? That's all there are in Oklahoma. Okay. You know, uh, it's, and he's, I mean, he, he's, he, I think he certainly is, it's, it's not much symbolism. I mean, he really is talking about a God, but you have to be careful about smuggling in what you're talk, thinking about when you think about it, when he says that, and, and know that he's seeing this God as this, like you said, the, 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 the basis of the, of the system, mm -hmm. right? The, the ordering principle. And, and I think that, I think he is griping about the empiricists here and, uh, and, saying that they've eroded uh, or the organizing principle yeah. behind everything. Yeah, and they're, they're trying to reduce everything to these errors of thought that he outlines earlier in the, in the book. But then they want to still be ordinary people. So there's a good line from Hume, David Hume, who was one of the people that figured out or, or made it explicit when you're looking at cause and effect, you're not actually seeing cause and effect. So cause and effect is merely a constant conjunction, then we construct cause and effect. That's David Hume. But he says something, that this is what you do when you're in the uh, billiard room playing philosopher. But when you walk out the door, you're going to act as if there, there is cause and effect. Right. So this is a shell game that people play. We're going to tear down all the foundations of our culture and not realize we did it. And Nietzsche's like, no, you did it. You did it. You know? You kill God, and it's a big deal, and you should know that it's a big deal. And um, there's somewhere he calls those British empiricists flatheads. Because mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't realize what they did. In paragraph 126. Mystical explanations. Mystical explanations are regarded as profound. The truth is that they do not even go the length of being superficial. Yeah, he's so funny. He is so funny. But these mystical explanations, it's really easy to read that and think that he's actually talking about religion. I'm not sure he's talking about religion. He's probably talking about the flatheads. Yeah, I think so. You think so? I think maybe. Yeah, I have to think about it. He, the, the, that's one of the things he does is when he, throw, when he gets aphoristic, you're supposed to chew on these things and, and go away and say, oh, what does he mean by that? I know he's really smart, and I know he's saying something. He saw something. What is he saying there? But it's kind of like poetry. Poetry doesn't tell you what to think about it. Poetry mm. leaves a whole lot vague. 
and then the human mind is such a thing that you fill in meaning as you you walk away after you read the poem. Like, oh, maybe that's it. You know, I, I, I think he's not talking about what we would normally call the mystical. I think he's talking about scientism here. And here's why I think that, because the next okay. paragraph he says, the thoughtless man thinks that the will is the only thing that operates, and that willing is something simple, manifestly giving, given, underived, and comprehensible in itself. He's convinced that when he does anything, for example, when he delivers a blow, it is he who strikes, and he has struck because he willed to strike, et cetera, et cetera. He thinks cause and effect is mystical, and he and he, uh, he rejects the will. Sure, and the self is mystical. Mm, I didn't catch that piece. Well, that there is a self that is the one that is acting. Mm, it is he who strikes, yeah. Yeah, um, that if you do something, there has to be a cause, and you're the cause, rather than bits of you are hungry, and so you grabbed a chip or something. Lions you know? are going to lion. Right, right. Uh, is... Um, but this pole of personality is perhaps, if he's right, a myth, a shadow of God. You know, a bunch of organisms in the primordial soup got together and formed a body, and we call it one thing. Uh, um, there's a whole lot that's got to go away, you know, if you want to be consistent on this. It's not, there's no God, hooray. <laughs> it's there's no god oh shit <laughs> that's uh that's the it seems to me a more proper reaction oh here in, in 127 he he, he bre broaches something i think is really interesting he says that if for people the will is a magically operating force um and then he says, in fact, whenever he saw anything happen, man originally believed in a will as cause and in personally willing beings operating in the background. The conception of mechanism was very remote from him because man for immense periods of time believed only in persons, not in matter, forces, things, etc. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what matter was or for gravity or electromagnetic force, strong, weak nuclear force, none of that stuff. Things... Yeah, it so was, it was people. It was agents in the world, and so if anything happened, gosh, there had to have been an agent. Right. Thales says the world's full of gods. That's twenty six hundred years ago, and what we've we've retracted from that, and so there are less and less gods. There's less and less personal agents out there, but we still have the self left. Why do we keep that one? Seems like it. Yeah, you know, it why not extend it one further step and say, well, there's really no you there and there's no me there. Now, I don't want to go there, okay? So this, for me personally, this is Carl talking. For me personally, this is a motive for me to say, you know what? Maybe the ancient metaphysics makes more sense. Because I certainly feel like I'm a person talking to another person. Carl would say, even if it's not true, isn't it better than we thought it was? <laughs> well, I have said that, but that's not what I'm saying here. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, you feel like you're talking to a person, right? The phenomenology is that you're there. Right. So f phenomenology. Um, so if you take a young couple in love and you explain to them, look, this is what love really is. It's pheromones. It's chemicals. Yuck. You know, it's, you're, there's no such thing as love. Right. And then the teenage girl says, but I love him. And so you've got, you've taken the experience that she has and you've dissected it and you've taken it apart and you've, you've gotten rid of it. And she nevertheless still feels it. Well, which one is the more privileged access to truth, her feeling or, you know, talking about chemistry. Right. Uh, so I guess I am a bit of a phenomenologist. I mean, I used to... And which one has more explanatory power, too? More predictive power than the other one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do this... You can... An experiment for you and the listeners, if you want to um, see if you have free will, for example. I could... I can construct... I was an annoying teenager who thought there wasn't free will. Uh, I remember my dad getting mad at me. He might listen to this. Um, and... He'd like stop the car and see, see, I stopped the car. That was free. And I'd say, yeah, well, you were preconditioned to do that. That's just, you know, and he just, I'm, I'm sure I was a pain in the ass. Um, 
But here's a test for you. Make yourself hungry. Order a pizza. Sit in front of it. Don't eat it. Put that dog treat right on the end of your nose and just sit and stay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So are you able to do that? And your your experience is going to be that I'm free. And so which one counts for more? That experience or the, I'm making scare quotes, scientific explanation that you know, there were prior causes to all of this stuff. And why do we pick one rather than the other? Um, so I don't want Nietzsche to be right. Uh, much as I, I love him, I love reading him, I don't want him to be right. And I, my motive pushes me towards old-fashioned metaphysics. If, if Levin Nietzsche is wrong, you don't want, <laughs> you to, don't be want right. to be right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to keep digging this thing where he talks about, in most of history, men, uh, man only believed in persons. Yeah. So I'm really interested in this impulse thing that he talked about earlier. And I think this goes to that. And then he says down here below that, this is on page 170 of this, if you guys are, uh, um, it's in uh, paragraph 127. He says, the propositions, no effect without a cause, and every effect, again, implies a cause, appear as generalizations of several less general prop uh, propositions. One, where there is operation, there has been willing. Oh, that's so good. Two, I numbered these, not him. Operating is only possible on willing beings. Three, there is never a pure, resultless experience of activity, but every experience involves stimulation of the will. <sighs> but in the, then he says, but in the primitive period of the human race, the latter and the former propositions were identical. The first were not generalizations of the second, but the second were explanations of the first. Uh, so I had to number those and kind of map all of that stuff out. Um, so there's no cause. Oh, there's no effect without a cause. And there ain't no causes without a will is kind of what he's saying here, I think. Mm -hmm. I did a short circuit that and screw it up. Uh, and, and this is what? This is Aristotle's book nine in the, in the physics yeah, and he's throwing it out the window, man. He is, and, and he's is right at the core of everything, right? Our, where do you experience cause and effect? And I'm, this is a something. This is from Edith Edith Stein. This is twentieth century. Where do you most primarily experience cause and effect? You experience it in the mind. Your first experience. You you say you say to yourself, "I'm going to go get some pizza," and then you get up and you go get pizza. You know. That's the only place you experience cause and effect genuinely is within your own mind. That's our first and primary experience of it. It makes sense that, in other words, we're looking at the whole universe, the whole structure of the universe as a projection of a personality. I think he's right. I think he's absolutely right about that cause and effect. So why does grav? Why does the pen fall? Is it grav or the gravity elf? Gravo's a person. That's why I use that example, right? Things are personal. Um, you kind of shrug at the end. Why does it fall? Well, I, I don't know. God wants it to fall. <laughs> it, well, it, well, he says, Schopenhauer, with his assumption that all that exists is something volitional, has set a primitive mythology on the throne. He would say that that pen had some volition. Yeah. Or, or well, or or Gravo. Or whatever is standing in for Gravo has volition. Something had to make a decision. Yeah, Aristotle famously says the rock wants to go down. Wants to go down. Yep. Yeah, it longs for its proper place. Uh, so I think this is Nietzsche's right on. We are thinking about structure of the universe in terms of personalities. That's where we start. You are, after all, a person, I presume, and you think of things in terms of personality. Um, and yet, so let's go back, personhood is a shadow of God. The idea that there is a center to all of the impulses and, and um, burps and bodily functions that comprise you, that is, you're smuggling, you might say you're smuggling in theology, you're smuggling at least a natural theology, philosophical theology, into your conception of science. Yeah, that's the shadow whether you're Sam Harris and claim you're uh, fully atheistic or not, we're swimming in that soup and you can't get out of it. Yeah. 
he says, contra Schopenhauer at the end of that paragraph, he made those one, two, and three, those, uh, t- those three uh, assertions about will there. And then he says at the end, firstly, in order that will may arise, an idea of pleasure and pain is necessary. Damn. Tell me why that. Well, I don't, it's just interesting. I mean, he's personifying all this some more. Um, I think that his, I don't know, we can't dig him up and ask him, but I think Nietzsche would say that the phenomenology of him exercising his will was always driven by pleasure or pain. Okay. I don't know. So you can reduce will ultimately to an animal avoiding pain avoiding pleasure seeking yeah uh volition maybe i don't know i think that's what he's saying secondly a vigorous excitation may be felt as pleasure or pain it is the affair of interpreting intellect uh blah 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 that's operating essentially vigorous ex- excitations can be experienced as pleasure or pain but there must be an interpreting intellect is what I, i'm seeing there what i'm reading there yes yeah Three, it is only an intellectual being, it is only in an intellectual being that there is pleasure, displeasure, and will. The immense majority of organisms have nothing of the kind. So this would be specifically against Schopenhauer talking about Volition. everything as, as being will. And at least here, Nietzsche is saying the only things that have will are things that can go a little bit beyond pleasure and pain. That have an interpreting intellect. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually, I remember reading this. We're both barbell coaches. I remember reading this and thinking about people tugging on a deadlift and stopping yep. because their intellect has interpreted as pain. Or like Becca Sigan says, effort is not the same thing as pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah. I, I, I love the idea that he sniffs at it a few times in here about that, that man's operating system has changed. Like he says here earlier in this same paragraph, we used to only know about people. We didn't know about forces and matter and all these other things that we've come up with, these other heuristics that we've come up with. Mm-hmm. We just thought about it in terms of people. But now we think of it in terms of all these other mythologies. And so, so you get to different kinds of answers because we're running different software than we used to. Yeah, and if you run the software all the way, you end up, uh, well, we got rid of persons in the rock. We don't think the rock wants to fall. Right. Why do we think that I want more bourbon? Because of quantum physics. <laughs> Explain. Well, I don't know. I mean, it was, <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 things have gotten so wacky that they, that, that, you know, certain models say that things can be in two places at once mm-hmm. and that you can know where it is, but you can't know what it weighs. And it's like, how could that possibly be? It's clearly a way of thinking about things. It's clearly a model. If there is a thing, we can know stuff about it. If you can't know stuff about it, it isn't something. And so, so science has gotten so abstract that it's gotten away. It's gotten, gotten, it's gotten cl- wacky. Yes. I don't know enough about quantum mechanics to get down to that level that it seems like personality ends up mattering. Like right. if you look at it, it does one thing. And if you don't look at it, it does another. What the hell is going on there? I don't understand. But just because, you know, you've got imaginary numbers in the equation and you've got two solution sets doesn't mean that the thing's two things. It can't. I mean, I don't know enough about it either. I'm talking on my ass here. Yeah. But... The point is, is that we have, we're running different software now. Well, and in it, thought, thought ain't like travel. Where you start out dictates where you end up. Yeah. And, well, keep in mind, are we dealing with concepts or things? Well, it's Which, concepts. That's all you can deal with, right? Right. And that's a good point that, to, here's a good, this is a good takeaway from Nietzsche. You remember that your conceptual <clears throat> um, framework isn't the thing. I think you said that earlier. The concept you have is not the thing. Um, I remember I was talking to my daughter. She was saying how tired she felt. She was fatigued. She uses words like that. She wouldn't say she's tired. She'd say, I'm fatigued. Father. 
father, I am fatigued. Yeah. Well, that's my kid. And, uh, I pointed out, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? You're fatigued. It's an extremely vague concept and we'll tell ourselves, well, what does it really mean? So in like in, in barbell training, it means you can't do the weight you did before your performance has suffered. Um, it's just, it's not the thing. There isn't a thing called fatigue that you can point to. It's a, it's a construct to explain something else. Mm -hmm. In other words, I was telling her to get up. <laughs> right. But these Put are the, dirt on it. I'm saying that's not a real thing. You know, <laughs> fatigue's not real. And she was yelling back at me. We've, we've gotten most of the, I don't know. I'm not going to say, I was going to say the meat. That's not true. But I think we've covered the most of this book that kind of hangs together, and the rest of it gets pretty aphoristic. But it's good. It's good. There's so much good stuff. 128, he, he says the most cynical possible reading of prayer. He says that people have been encouraged to prayer because they, they sit quietly and they look proper while yeah. they're doing it. That's pretty much the good of prayer for most people, he says. Yeah, maybe some people actually do prayer, but most of us, it's just to keep us quiet. Um, in every religion, the religious man is an exception. Yeah. I chuckled. And he says, God himself cannot subsist without wise men, said Luther. But God can still less subsist without wise, unwise men. Good Luther did not say that, he says. Yeah. Um, the Christian resolution to find the world ugly and bad has made the world ugly and bad. Oh, he's, it's so, it's funny. I mean, maybe you don't agree. Maybe you think he's wrong, but he's funny. And then you think... I'm offended. So you read Nietzsche and you write, I, I'm offended. But it was kind of funny. It's like somebody makes a, a joke about your mother and <laughs> you laugh and they're like, hey. And then you have to figure out why it's not true. I, I kind of agree with that. Not that it actually made the world, world ugly and bad. You know, in Hamlet, nothing is good, neither good nor bad except thinking make it so. Yeah. You know, if you, if the focus is on sin nature and fallenness and you'll see a whole lot of it and 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 it, it could be it could make us blind to see some of the good the focus on those things ask the calvinist matt reynolds yeah yeah so uh if you um if you're on team religion you know you read something like that and you say you have to think is he right am i and is that the core of what i believe you know fallen nature and I think that's a real challenge. It's a useful challenge to you. You know, you should be able to have a good answer to that and say, no, in fact, the world is not ugly and bad. And then you clarify what you mean when you talk about, say you're a Calvinist and you talk about total depravity or something like that. You know, what do you really mean by that? Right. So it, it can be clarif clarificatory. Is that a word? Sure. Um, Carl Rithick. Yeah. So Nietzsche is like an anvil. <laughs> <laughs> that you beat yourself upon. Oh, he's like a hammer that you hit yourself with. Yeah. Um, Christianity and suicide. He says that uh, Christianity made suicide bad, except for martyrdom and self-annihilation of ascetics. Oh, yes. That's so <laughs> Right. And, right. And you're reading this. Again, you're reading this. Like, I, <sighs> what an asshole. It's so, it's so good. But like, I have, I got friends who are monks, you know, are living an ascetic life and... And and you read some of the early accounts of the martyrs, and it sure looks like suicide. You read you read Saint Ignatius's letters as he's on his way to get eaten by lions, and he really wants to go. Like this is a suicide note. He's 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 like you've got to think. Well, is that true? You know, has it just taken this urge to self? Is it, is it really true that Christianity is just mask self-destruction? Well, I, I particularly like the idea about the slow self annihilation of the ascetic. I mean, so he, he must think that there's something good about non asceticism. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, he would, th I think he thinks that a, uh, a pleasurable human existence is worthwhile. Nietzsche would, I mean. Yeah, well, there's a bit of irony there because yeah. if you're talking about self-annihilation and yet previously he's disputed the existence of the self. Right. But there's something, there's something experiencing the good thing there that makes the asceticism bad. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. it's okay. 
he's he's being he's being clever. Axioms, he says that in the law, uh, axioms that we almost we must always fall back on are the best ones. And he says, in the long run, that means a hundred thousand years hence. I got in a little bit of a internet tussle with a guy about the anabolic window. The right, anabolic you tr- window. that used to be an idea that you'd train weightlifting or whatever, mm-hmm. and then you had to eat protein and in all your building blocks within a certain amount of time within training. And if you didn't, and if then you did, all of your training was pointless. It didn't, it didn't work. Yeah. And, and the science I'm making the air quotes has, doesn't believe that anymore. So in a hundred thousand years, we'll know maybe. <laughs> yeah. What things that we believe now, will we believe a hundred thousand years from now? Two plus two equals four. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, that's another book too. Uh, he draws uh, lines between uh, uh, religion and diet. He says that the German dislike of life, <laughs> including the influence of, uh, of the cellar air and stove poisoning in German dwellings, is essentially a cold weather complaint. <laughs> and he, I think he's speculating that like Lutheranism came out of like <laughs> yeah. If Luther lived in Italy, right, then there wouldn't be Lutherans. Ah, oh, he's just so, he's just so. Cl- so clever um we could we could just keep continue to pick and choose maybe we should just read a few more of these things here um the greeks had no feeling of sin uh so this is 135 mm. um talking about the so this would be about the transformation that uh christian religion and jewish religion have made upon european culture um, and so we read, we read, we start with the Iliad and the Odyssey and online great books and, you know, Achilles, um, a lot of people don't like Achilles, but nobody in the books ever says to Achilles, you're sinning, you know, mm. you're, they all, they never say that he's doing bad things cause they don't have that category. Um, so this is, uh, Nietzsche to what an extent this has succeeded in Europe is traced back most accurately in the extent of our alienist to Greek antiquity a world without the feeling of sin. They just didn't have it. They never repent. Um, that that's a, a com- that's like a, a completely different heuristic that the modern world has. Th- th- that's more that same quote from earlier about Christianity and an effort to, uh, or in seeing the world as ugly and bad has made it so. Mm-hmm. With, without that concept of sin, you don't have that experience of that shame and that guilt Achilles, I don't think, was kept up at night <laughs> no. by his behavior. No, well, not to the end, but right. spoiler. But, uh, well, you know, okay, but then you look at Achilles and you say, maybe he would have benefited by having an idea of sin. At the end, when he's beating um, when he's beating the body of Hector and just dragging it around, and he can get uh, modern wording, get no closure, you know, until the gods magically make it happen... Um, because maybe if he could have just said, I'm sorry, you know, and gone into the ancient Greek confessional and gotten some penance or something, you know, that, that, uh, maybe part of the problem is that he did lack the concept. In other words, I mean, Nietzsche is absolutely correct. They don't have this concept. Yep. Run a different software. Right. But is it good that they don't have it? Well, that's where I'm not so sure. He, he says... Uh, at the end of that same paragraph, in their need, there the Greeks, in their need to attribute dignity to transgression and embody it therein, they invented tragedy, an art and a delight, which in its profoundest uh, essence has remained alien to the Jew in spite of all his poetic endowment and taste for the sublime. Uh, yeah, because the Jews had that, that sin conception. So they... they, they it's, yeah, you it, can't do a tragedy. because So we read a tragedy and um, you read... Uh, Oedipus, okay, for example. And uh, Oedipus, does Oedipus do anything wrong? That's a question that I typically ask. In those Greek tragedies, they're all undone by what's best about them. Yeah. He's strong. He's smart, you know. So he beat these people in in combat. He uh, answered the riddles of the Sphinx. He became the ruler. And all of those things ended up, and he was awarded this beautiful wife. All the good things about him got him hard times. Right. And so tragedy might be something that we can't really do very well. Maybe if we're becoming post-Christian, we can do tragedy again. 
maybe. Cool hand, Luke. It's, it's tragedy. Been a while. I think it's a tragedy. Luke, Tell me why. Well, Luke's undone by what's best about Luke. His his uh his unbeatable spirit, you know, his 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 individualism, his uh um uh, you know, his Lukeness. Mm-hmm. You know, he he's an American. Uh he he doesn't uh, he bristles at uh he bristles at authority and uh it, just because the man told you to do it, it's not a good enough reason for him. And uh and he he suffers for it. It's my favorite movie. I'll have to go back and watch it. This, this, and, and True Grit, right? Well, no, True Grit's a good one, but not it ain't Cool Hand Luke. Cool Hand Luke's my, is is the best. Yeah. So now we ha- all of our stories have to have a happy ending. There has to be redemption at the end of the story. There has to be closure yes. and redemption at the end of the story. The Greek tragedies, everybody dies. Right. Right. It, there's nothing to be redeemed. Hamlet, everybody dies. Yeah. So Shakespeare wrote tragedies. Yeah. When did they stop? Uh, seven is the Brad Pitt maybe movie. Maybe Shakespeare's a an anomaly. Is that Brad Pitt movie seven? Is that a tragedy? <laughs> You're pulling movies I haven't seen in years. I haven't seen it in years either because that's all I've seen. Is like I haven't seen hardly anything. In the yeah, do you think we've made enough movies? Yes. Should we be done making movies? Uh, I think so. <laughs> when you're making remakes of Aladdin, right? I, I think you, we've reached peak movie. Should just everybody should just go watch Casablanca and True Grit, Cool Hand Luke, and The Searchers. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, have we, that we have, be it. we have to we have to have the redemption at the end of our stories now. Um, let's see. Do we have any more aphorisms that you just have to share here? He says that the danger of vegetarians is the immense prevalence of rice eating impels uh, people to the use of opium and narcotics. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just like immense prevalence of potato eating impels to the use of brandy. Potato eating leads to brandy? That's what he says here. I guess. I don't know. So you get these kind of things in there and you're going to like, what What are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, one that I like is um, 139. So you read this and you go back and you read the Greeks. He's a very perceptive reader of the Greeks. So if you want to read the ancient stuff, Nietzsche's going to help you when you f- you read the Greeks first, then read him, and then go back, and you'll 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 read it with a little more color to it. Um, so he's comparing the ancient Greeks to to the Apostle Paul, uh, that he thinks that Paul has an evil eye for the passions. They mm-hmm. learn to know only the filthy, the distorting, the heart breaking in them. So if you read the letters of Paul, there he, he talks about things that you shouldn't do. And there's a lot of bodily things that you shouldn't do. The Greeks quite otherwise than Paul and the Jews directed their ideal aim precisely to the passions and loved, elevated, embellished, and deified them. Uh, In passion, they evidently not only felt themselves happier, but also purer and diviner than otherwise. So when you go back and you find that there's a goddess of sex, Aphrodite, you know, um, that this is a passion made into a goddess, you know, and Ares is a god. So this is the, the butchery of war, the, the, the madness of war made into a, to a god. And they didn't feel shame for passions. They had, a, this is once again, different software for, uh, we've changed quite a bit. You look at Achilles and you, you're thinking, he, he must think he's done something bad and he really doesn't. Mm. And nobody else does. For them, passions were what were the point of living. Um, whereas we have different ideas. He says uh, to that Greek aesthetic, we love the grandeur of nature and have discovered it. I think that's worth mentioning because the Greeks didn't do landscapes and stuff. No. They didn't. Um, and, th- and then he goes on to say, that is because human grandeur is lacking in our minds. It was the reverse with the Greeks. The feeling towards nature was quite different from ours. Ooh, that's good. Where did you find that's, it? That's uh, 155. Yeah, that's... Yeah, you know, you, you, were just, you mentioned a while ago about the, your atheist buddies. Like, here, look at this uh, star chart, you know. Yeah. Feel humbled. And yeah. I've, never, I've, never, I've never been moved by uh, the, the mountain view or any of that stuff. Um, because there's always more in, in the mind than there. Right. Well, so it's like Socrates and Phaedrus. He's never going to take a walk in the countryside because people are more interesting. Right. 
And if you don't think people are that interesting or that good or have grandeur to them, if you think they're ugly and bad, then you, you I guess you paint landscapes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's so good. Any more, Carl? Uh, how many more hours do you want to do? No, we could do forever. The first musician for me would be he who knew only the sorrow of the profoundest happiness and no other sorrow. There has not hitherto been such a musician. The sorrow of pure happiness. The sorrow of pure happiness. I really, so I want to give you where my political quote is. This is 174. So for all your friends in the audience, uh, mm. talking about politics, uh, parliamentary, parliamentarism, that is to say the public permission to choose between the five main political opinions, uh, insinuates itself into the favor of the numerous class that would fain appear independent and individual and like to fight for their opinions. In other words, there's five things you can think, and this is for people who want to act like they're actually fighting, but aren't really. Because this is you, in Germany, because they've got, you know, 40 political uh, right, parties. Right, I guess we would have two political opinions. Right. But he who diverges from the five public opinions and goes apart has always the whole herd against them. And I wrote, yes, next to that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And for him, the herd, by the way, he was talking about the herd uh, in terms of morality and ethics. And you got to think a certain way to protect the herd earlier. He was talking about talking about that. I don't know if he I don't know if that if that herd there means the same as herd did there in the second or third. I, paragraph. Bet, it, I bet it does. I bet it does, too. So, you know, if that's the case, that those five political ideas. Those are the only ones that can help the herd, and the other ones are harmful to the herd. Well, they're perceived as harmful to the herd, and the herd's only going to think in the ways that it's always thought. This artist, number 187, this artist offends me by the way in which he expresses his ideas, his very excellent ideas, so diffusely and forcibly and with such gross rhetor rhetorical artifices as if he were speaking to the mob. We always feel as if in bad company when devoting some time to his art. Who is that? Who's he talking about? Probably Wagner. Yeah. I like it. Laughable. See, see, he runs away from men. They follow him however he runs before them. They're such a gregarious lot, he says. Uh, right after that, so since we're pulling out, this is what you're going to do when you read this. You're going to circle stuff and say, yes, or cool, or what? So 196, the limits of our sense and hearing. We hear... Only the questions to which we are capable of finding an answer. And you're going to walk away and say, what does that mean? Well, the only questions that you typically ask are ones that you think you can solve. And there might be questions that you never thought of. This is like, what was Rumsfeld's thing? We have the known knowns and the unknown knowns yep. and the unknown unknowns. Well, you don't know about the unknown unknowns. And so you can't even ask him a question. Against mediators. Boring moderates, Carl. <laughs> he who attempts to mediate between two decided thinkers is rightly called mediocre. He has not an eye for seeing the unique. Similarizing and equalizing are signs of weak eyes. What, 232, dreaming. Either one does not dream at all or one dreams in an interesting manner. One must learn to be awake in the same fashion, either not at all or in an interesting manner. Uh, 219, <laughs> the object of punishment is to improve him who punishes. Yep. That is the ultimate appeal of those who justify punishment. That's, I wonder what his home life was like. Uh, I think this is the last one, Carl. Okay. Books. Of what account is a book that never carries us away beyond all books? I would say it's not very good. And yeah. this is certainly one of those that carries you beyond all books. Yeah, and this is just book three of, uh, of, of the, the joyful wisdom. Um, we would probably call that a chapter nowadays, uh, but... Uh, let's see, how many pages is this, Carl? Yeah, this is 50, I don't know, 55 pages of pretty big print. And uh, it's a lot of fun to read. He'll make you laugh. If he doesn't make you laugh, you probably need to read it again. And uh, you Take should yourself less seriously. Yeah, he's, he's, he's wonderful. He, he set out to make you mad, make fun of you. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think he, he probably was not a very happy person. I mean, he would write these things and nobody would read them, or not very many people would read them. And the ones that would, wouldn't understand them, you know, like, um, Nazis thought that they liked Nietzsche, but they never read him. They didn't understand it, you know, 
Right. Uh, it, it's um. Let me sum up. You should go read some. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And note, note that he's not dropping all these names. He's talking about these Greek tragedies. He talks about Shakespeare in here. He talks about uh, he talks about Schopenhauer and he talks about Kant and he talks about Hume. He talks about all of these people that we read and and, and having read some of these uh, sure sure make uh, sure make him a little more accessible. So go read that stuff if you. Uh, we're going to do a show here soon about how to start a group in your home. So if you haven't joined us, you need to start a group because you know talking about this stuff like Carl and I just did helped me a lot. We're on the back porch of a Airbnb we rented in Missouri. It's halfway between Carl's house and my house. We met here and. Uh, spend an afternoon talk about uh, Nietzsche. So thanks for listening in on our conversation. Go to onlinegreatbooks.com and join our uh, our waiting list. And the next time we open up enrollment, uh, we'll let you in. Yep, hope to see you.